Hi there, my name is Sarah Paxton. I'm the Community and Events Marketing Manager at Optimal Workshop, and thank you so much for joining us for a Lunch and Learn session. Um, without further ado, I will hand over to our lovely presenter, Sarah, to introduce herself, um, share her screen, and we'll crack right into facilitation. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, so a uh, bit of an intro to myself. Uh, so I'm Sarah Heimeyer. So I'm lead service designer at Prosper. And then I also uh, do coaching, run workshops or training on the side as well. Uh, talking on all things design uh, and service design, any any area. And then today my, my key one is facilitation. Uh, so I'll share my screen for you. Uh, so uh, what... I wanted to start off with was a bit of a, a story in terms of when I was running a, a research session and it wasn't really going, going to plan. Uh, so I was running a group research session and we had a bunch of other designers uh, who were also helping to facilitate the session. Uh, we had about 10 different customers uh, as part of it. And we we're trying to understand uh, about a financial advice experience uh, that we were creating to get their feedback on it. And, it was quite an expensive day uh, just because we were paying for a full day to, to run this session with these 10 people. Uh, and we were wanting to understand the level of detail that customers were looking for in their, in their financial uh, advice plan. So when, when once they get to the end of the experience, you normally get a, a financial plan for you to, to basically look through. And we were running the first activity and it wasn't really going to plan. Uh, so we weren't getting the outcomes that we were looking for in the session. We weren't uh, able to, to get and achieve those objectives and get the understanding that we we're looking for from the participants. And it was basically from the, the structure of the, the activity that we, we had defined. And so we were wanting to, to also understand as part of that was the, the structure of the, the document that we were giving them, like how should we structure it? What works, what doesn't work? And we weren't getting that level of detail, like I said. And so instead of continuing to, to kind of like force the activity to work, uh, what we did was we took a 15 minute break uh, and basically regrouped while our participants had some snacks. So we had some snacks on the side and we were just like, let's take a little break while we figure this out. And this is just one of the examples of why I uh, found being able to evaluate on the spot and readjust and reflect on your outcomes as you're facilitating is super important as part of facilitation. And so it's allowing you to understand if you're getting to the right outcome or not. Uh, so as Part of the this session, uh, I'm going to take us through uh, facilitation. Uh, what do you need to do? How does it work? And then uh, I just wanted to give a bit more bit more context uh, just on myself. So uh, I've worked in design for uh, over over ten years, over a decade. Uh, I've worked on large transformation projects for financial institutions. Uh, spoken at UX Australia and and a few other places. Speaking here right now. Uh, and so the first area that I really wanted to deep dive in uh, as part of facilitation is what is the, the role of designers as a facilitator? And so your role is really around being a guide, mentor, and also a catalyst as part of the session. So guiding to get to the objectives that you're looking for, moderating the session to make sure that we're, we're achieving those outcomes that we worked towards, but then also a catalyst. So posing questions, exploring topics, really deep diving. And then the other part of that being a moderator uh, as part of the session is really to create a safe and inclusive environment so that everyone feels like they can share ideas. So if you have really strong voices, uh, making sure that you're sharing that microphone with everyone so that they can all engage. And then the other part is really around helping others to take those risks and share those ideas. So making it, uh, ensuring that you have psychological safety as part of it. Uh, and so what I always love to do, like examples of how I do this and the strategies that that I put in place to allow me to basically fulfill this role is to set the ground rules as part of the session. So how, how do we want people to engage during this session? What is the, the mode that I want you to be in? Are we coming up with ideas? Are we understanding a problem? What does all of that look like? And then establishing trust, uh, trust building activities. So putting as part of my agenda, if we really, if everyone hasn't worked together before, how do we build that trust really quickly as well? And then, uh, as part of uh, creating a safe space for people to take risks, it's really important to create a, a physically comfortable space to really start to foster psychological safety. 
And so by having psychological safety, it allows people to then feel like they can uh, share their ideas, take those risks and really work in a way that's that's really ad advantageous to you getting the outcomes that you're looking for. And so to create that psychological safety, what's really important is to encourage mistakes, uh, embrace sharing your thoughts and ideas, not having to to double think or or think about them or question them, just being able to share them. There's no right or wrong. So creating that environment and then encouraging to people to share different perspectives as well. And then the other part that's really important uh, as your role as a, as a facilitator is active listening. So making sure that you're getting the most out of your, out of your participants. So listening to their perspective, asking more questions, uh, encouraging them to deep dive, deep, deep dive more. Uh, asking follow-up questions as well in terms of what they've shared. So uh, like I was saying before, encouraging them to really start to share different ideas and ask questions. Uh, so I always like to think of facilitation as like a big group interview. And so you're interviewing others to really build out and, and learn more. And so you're asking open-ended questions to start to explore. You're listening to what everyone's sharing. You're observing the interactions that everyone has. Uh, and so an example of this that I always like to do is basically deep diving further into their stories. So like an interview, you're asking more in terms of like telling an example of this, uh, picking up on certain points that you need to understand a bit more to be able to facilitate getting to those objectives that you have. Uh, and then and then the other part of this uh, is around, so as part of like active listening, uh, so having those skills, uh, what, what you can do to demonstrate that you're listening or like to basically actively listen is to make eye contact with the people who are speaking, uh, paraphrase what the participants said, and then ask any clarifying questions so that you're really starting to understand what are they saying, what are they sharing? And then as part of that as well, taking any notes. And then the other part is to observe any nonverbal cues. So what is the person doing? Uh, what is their body language? What is their facial expression, tone of voice? And really starting to get that insight into how are they, uh, uh, how are they feeling during the session? Do they feel comfortable? Should you continue asking any more questions? Should you take a bit of a break uh, and and not not ask and and move on to another participant that's uh, in your workshop? Uh, and so really starting to gain insight into the different participants' emotions and reactions to the the session, so that you can then actively ask different and more questions as well. And then the last one that I have around uh, your role as a facilitator, uh, as a designer is open communication. And so what I find is a, a nice way to, to start with it, uh, to encourage that is uh, icebreaker activities. So uh, making sure that you're, if you haven't worked together before or the particular session is around coming up with ideas or it's about team building uh, is to have icebreaker activities that really start to then build that, that, uh, that team environment and get everyone working together and coming up with ideas uh, with with the other people in the workshop. And then help, it really helps to then understand their motivations, desires, and pain points. So by building that relationship with others, you're able to then get a deeper understanding. People are much more willing to provide that understanding and to share it with you. And so how, how I've really started to encourage that open communication is by having people write down their thoughts. Uh, they, uh, they might not have to share it with everyone, but encouraging them to write it down uh, so that it's documented. And then also making sure that the more senior person in the room is, isn't is always the person that speaks first. So making sure that I'm encouraging other people so that they feel safe to share their ideas and to have that open communication. And what I'll also do is I'll let people, uh, I'll let the senior person who's coming to the workshop uh, let them know beforehand as well that this is the role that I want them to play. I want to make sure that I gather all the insights from others as well and making those participants the focus of the session and then so that you can get that open discussion and, and conversation from everyone. And so to be able to really get that open communication, it's really about setting clear expectations for collaboration. So how, how are we going to collaborate with each other? So kind of like what I was talking about before is having those ground rules. So how do we engage during the session how do we interact what is the the way or like mode of thinking that I want you to be in and so encouraging that active participation from people uh, but also making sure that everyone's respecting other people's opinions so it's even if their opinion is different making sure that they have their 
either building on it or even if their opinion is different, providing that alternative point of view uh, and then embracing that diversity of thought. So making sure that everyone knows that what they contributed is really valuable. And so how I always like to do that is by thanking people for their contributions. And so actively being like, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to now explore this other topic. So I use that as like a bit of a transition uh, kind of phrase, but it's in, uh, saying thank you for for sharing and then moving on to another topic or at the end of it, end of the workshop or session that I'm facilitating, making sure that I, I thank everyone for their time and thank them for sharing their views as often a facilitation session where you're workshopping with a lot of people. Uh, it can be really tiring for the people who are attending. So making sure that you're thanking them for for that deliver uh, for that sharing of their thoughts and for that like mental energy that they've they've put out. Uh, then the next point that I wanted to deep dive into in terms of being a really great facilitator is the so the principles of effective facilitation. And so what I find works fantastic for a workshop and making sure that you have effective facilitation and, a, and get to that outcome that you're looking for is the first step I always take is to define clear objectives. So these basically are, what am I looking to get out of the session? What are my objectives? What do I want to understand? And that's how I usually start my objectives is like understand X or define this, this item. And so getting really clear on that so that during the session, I'm able to provide direction as to what it is, what is the purpose of it? What is the outcome we're working towards? And then I'm constantly reflecting on it to make sure, are we hitting this objective? Do I need to adjust the activities? Similar to that story that I shared, um, constantly reflecting and going, have I hit this? Do we need to do something different? Do I need to change activities? Do I need to adjust it? Do I need to ask more direct questions because we're running out of time? And it also helps you to know what you're working towards. And then therefore, when you're planning for the workshop, what activities do I need to do? What can I do to be able to get to these outcomes? So therefore you're designing and crafting the activities or questions or things that you're doing in the workshop to enable you to get to those outcomes. And what I always do at the start of a session is to then communicate it to the participants. So letting them know that this is these are the objectives that we're working towards. And so this is uh, what we're going to be focusing on for, for the session. And then this is the agenda that we have. So letting them know uh, all of the context that they need. So then if I end up closing down conversations, they know why I'm wanting to move us along because we're, we have these particular outcomes that we're working towards, these objectives and these agenda items, and it's quite a tight schedule or we need to focus on these ones. So therefore we'll need to move along and make sure that this is the, the clear focus for us. And I always find that it really helps to then manage those expectations and keep everyone focused as well because they know what we're working towards. And they know why they're in the room as well. So we're all working towards this common goal. And then, then it's not uh, seen as inappropriate if I if I end up shutting down a conversation or wanting to move us along. Uh, and so an example that I have in terms of when I've defined the uh, really clear objectives is when I was running a session with, with our partners uh, that we work with, uh, and it's an external team that provides a service to us is that we were looking at building out and developing that team relationship. And so what I did as part of that was I defined the overall objectives of, of the session. And what we were, really wanted to do was figure out better ways of working. How do we work better with them? What is everyone's roles and responsibilities? And so then we defined all of that. Uh, and then I worked with the, the team member who wanted to have this session on defining those activities to make sure that we were going to get to those objectives. Uh, and then as I ran, ran the session, I was basically, I had a printed out, printout of my object objectives uh, and also my agenda stuck up on the walls. And then I had my own version that I was then using to cross off. Have we reached these objectives? Are we getting there? Have we done these activities? Do I need to adjust? Do I need to change any of the time that we have that we spend on this? So that I'm constantly referring to it and making sure that I'm hitting the objectives so that by the end of the session, I know that I've got got the value out or delivered the value that that we're looking for. And so for that example, where, where we're trying to build that relationship, we by the end of it, we hit all of the objectives. We're able to define everyone's role, uh, talk about any any like elephants in the room that we had in terms of that was stopping the, the relationship from moving forward. 
and then come up with like really clear next steps for us for us to take as as a team and to work with the these partners that we had and from doing that uh the key reason we were able to to have those really clear things was because we had really defined objectives and we progressively moved throughout them during the session and then so you have your objectives defined and then like i was kind of talking about creating really engaging activities so from the objectives, you're basically using those to then define the activities that you're doing. And so having those activities, you can then use them uh, to basically help you generate ideas, help you to solve problems collabor collaboratively, or you can even use it to then go through uh, and understand an area that you're, that you're really looking for. So either have questions to explore, have uh, processes or research methods that you're using during the session, to basically do a really big co-design with people to, to start to really understand an area. And so once you've got those objectives, you're able to easily define the activities that you're going to do to get there. Uh, and so things that I always, uh, some ideas in terms of activity ideas. And so this will depend on the, the, the uh, phase of the design process that you're up to. But uh, say if you're coming off ideas, doing it like an idea burst where you're coming up with a bunch of different ideas, uh, a role play of scenarios. So what I would always do when we're role playing services uh, and a conversation is that we'd actually have someone role play that in front of when we're doing a group research session uh, and have two people that were role playing the conversation. Then we'd have particular activities that are associated with that to reflect on it. Like, did it make sense? What, what information were you looking for? What was missing from that conversation? And then we'd also be able to see customers' reactions from it when we were doing those role plays of the experiences as well. Uh, and then rapid prototyping exercises. So what I always really love to do is uh, say either a card sort or getting my participants to make some wireframes. Uh, so for the card sort activity, how I've done this before is that uh, giving people basically like these are the different components of the design. Uh, you can adjust them in any way that you want. They can be bigger, they can be smaller, they can be uh, stacked on top of each other as like a menu or something and giving them all of that so that what they can do is then basically build out and prototype what the experience looks like. And then we can then either create the, the user flow together or it's really just about let's make that screen together and like let's prototype it together and see how it works and then have that discussion point with them. Uh, and then say if you're doing a brainstorming, activities uh what i always love to do is like say a mind mapping exercise where i'm either getting people to do it individually where we're deep diving on a particular area and we're really starting to map out how does it work how, what does it look like uh or we're doing it together and so we're working together to basically build out this mind map and to really start to see how does it work uh what are, what is everyone's thoughts on it and we're crafting it together uh well the other one is uh, so, uh, going through and going as part of like saying experience, what would we substitute? What could we combine? What, what could we adapt, modify, uh, put to another loop, use, eliminate or reverse. So thinking about different components of, of a, an area and going, what if we substituted this? What if we did this differently? What if we adapted or modified this part of, part of the, the moment in time? Uh, and you could do this on screens. You could do this as part of like reviewing a storyboard or a journey or a blueprint and really starting to understand what's working and what's not. Or one of the other ones that that uh, I find works really good in as part of facilitating workshops is um, say the six thinking hats. Uh, so this is where it gives you a way to look at problems in different ways. And so you're basically putting on these different hats or you're getting your participants of the workshop uh, to each have this hat on as you start to say analyze or get feedback on uh, something you've defined and it might be where you're deep diving on a problem or it might be that you have the solution like we're putting on these different hats to to start to explore it and so the different ones that they that there are is the like conductor's hat uh, who's basically like, conducting the session uh, the creative hat the um, hat for the heart uh, the optimist hat and then the judges hat. So you're putting on these different hats to really start to explore what's what's happening. And they're providing these different critiques rather than from their, themselves and their own position. It's providing these different ways of thinking and ways to think about it. And so it helps you to then have this different activity to then be able to facilitate this 
alternative way of thinking with everyone. And they're not just coming from their own role as well. They're being able to provide insight by basically putting themselves in a different position. And you can even do this where uh, instead of using those hats, you're using different roles potentially. So say you might have someone that works in your financial control team, uh, getting them to put on like a customer's hat or getting them to put on like, what if you were a salesperson, how would this work? And getting them to start to explore from different people's perspectives as to what might be some of the problems with what we've come up with or what are your thoughts on, on this experience? Uh, and so the key elements around defining those activities that you have is, uh, is really about promoting engagement. So you, you have a session with multiple people, so you really want to get them engaged. You want to get them to think differently. Uh, you want to uh, like basically get people to start thinking creatively and thinking about uh, different ways to do things. And then you want to generate innovative solutions. So depending on what part of the design process you're up to, uh, but you're wanting to come up with ideas or you're wanting to solve those research object those objectives that you have as part of the facilitate as part of the session that you're running. And so making sure that those activities are kind of touching on either one or like multiples of these, or it might be uh, all of them at once, depending on the type of session that you're running. Uh, and then the other part that's really important in terms of when you're facilitating is really around managing those group dynamics. So kind of like what I was talking about is that you're bringing different people together and you might have more dominant personalities. Uh, and so making sure that you're able to manage those different personalities of how people are engaging with each other uh, and how do you put things in place so that you're providing strategies for people to uh to not have dominant personalities take over the session to make sure that you're allowing everyone to participate. Because the thing is, uh, if one person is just sharing all of their thoughts, it's not really a, a workshop or a session that you're facilitating. It's, it basically becomes a one-on-one -on -one interview and you want to remove that. You want to make it something where everyone's able to engage and share their thoughts. Uh, but the other thing is, is that you want to make sure that you're not having just group think. So say if you have a dominant personality and if it's a, a senior leader, that the people, other people in the workshop report to, uh, you don't want them to just agree with that person. And so coming up with ways to reduce reduce that and encourage people to, to share in different ways as well. So what I often like to do is to get people to write down their thoughts. So having them to basically uh, on a post-it note or on a Miro board on their own post-it note, write down uh, a response to this or come up with their own solution. And then we'll share back. And I'll ask some questions. Other people will be able to ask some questions in a in a cap time period. Uh, and then the other part uh, of managing group dynamics is if there's potentially any lack of participation. So if someone's not engaging, there they might be playing on their computer. They might not know exactly like what do you expect from them. And so making sure that you're being mindful of that. And so what I always love to do, say if someone's not participating, uh, is to either set the activity. Uh, and then have a conversation with that person to to ask, is there a reason why they're not engaging? Do they need some more information? Do they want to brainstorm with me? Uh, do they want to have like a separate session where we deep dive on that together? I'm just going to have some waters. No, I'm loving all the, the gifts at the bottom. Um, mm -hmm makes it lots of fun yeah. <laughs> that was the best part of putting it together <laughs> uh, and then the other part that's really important in terms of like managing those group dynamics is making sure that everyone's voice is heard so like I was saying uh, for those top ones that we have which is around dominant personalities group think or lack of participation you're wanting to use all of those different strategies to make sure that everyone's voice is heard and that you're bringing everyone along in that journey and they feel involved, especially when you're coming up with solutions. You want people to feel like they're part of it and that they're engaging with it as well. And then the other part of it is uh, for managing group dynamics is to make sure that you're neutral as a facilitator. So you're not coming with a preconceived uh, outcome or objective that you're wanting to, to make sure that we get towards. And you're really working to understand from other people's perspectives. So whether the session's with customers, whether it's with uh, people in the business, 
or it's with uh, like partners with your that work with your organization. You're basically there to facilitate an outcome and you might have thoughts and opinions on it. But I always like to stay really neutral in terms of I'm not sure what's going to come out of this session. Uh, I have my objectives uh, that we want to reach, but I'm not entirely sure in terms of what's going to be the overarching outcome of it. And I find this is uh, similar to the design process is that you don't want to have a predefined uh, solution that you're that you've already come with when you're trying to explore a problem and it's the same with facilitation you're wanting to be really neutral in terms of what you're doing and not guide or direct people to a solution that you've already defined uh, you're more guiding them towards achieving those objectives of this session and then uh, as part of the managing group dynamics uh, focusing on a common goal as well uh, so like I was talking about making sure everyone's across uh, what is the objective of the session, what is the uh, agenda of it, and we're working towards this common goal together. So making sure that we're all working towards and know what we're doing. And so uh, like I was sharing before, what I always love to do for this is to basically define at the start of the session, this is what we're doing, this is the objective, this is the agenda. But then as I deep dive into each of the different areas is that I really like to, uh, when I'm introducing a, uh, a activity that we're working towards is to really talk about uh, and making sure that everyone understands the purpose of this goal. Why are we doing it? What are we looking to, to get to, towards? Uh, so they really start to understand what, what we're doing and why. And so that they can also perform their best because what you're wanting to do, everyone wants to make sure that they provide value. And so they wanna know exactly what do they need to do uh, and why so that they they feel like they're contributing and they've provided a valuable uh, input as well during the session. Uh, so then the next area that I wanted to go through was really around the, the techniques for success. And so what you need to do as part of a workshop is really start to, is to design an effective structure. So balancing the structure with flexibility. And so kind of like I've been talking about is that you want to, when you're planning for a workshop, you want to have a really defined, uh, you want to have a really defined struct, uh, defined activities that you're working towards. So you have those objectives and you have the activities, uh, but you never know what's going to come along uh, as you're kind of progressing through the session. And so being able to balance and know that you're going to need to work on, uh, think on your feet. And so going, I have this structure, but I'm also flexible to changing it. Uh, so you have that framework that you've defined and also a clear agenda. But I always love to to go, this is what I've got. But if I need to change it, I'm open to um, adopting a different way of doing it, uh, to be um, being able to think differently. If an activity takes longer, then I might need to adjust how, uh, how long some of the other activities are taking, or I might need to reduce them down to make sure that I still get to those objectives. Or it might be that I need to actually run two sessions. Uh, and, it, and the other part of this is to really start to go through and know that uh, if there is like an elephant in the room, that means that you can't work past it, then it's also calling that out and going, uh, is this necessary for us to solve, for us to be able to, to basically get to these objectives that we're working towards at, at, during the session? I find that really valuable when you're working with, uh, when you're doing an internal workshop, because that's usually when they'll, they'll come up. Is it either something's come out that we actually realize that actually we need to pause, solve this, or clarify our understanding for us to be able to move on and do the do the other things and it might be how I've had this come about before is say when a project hasn't uh the scope might not be have been like fully refined yet uh, and we need to solve that so that we can then continue with ideation to go uh is this in scope is this out of scope can we continue coming up with ideas based on this area or do we need to adjust and change so instead of pushing along the session taking that pause and clarifying that and then potentially having another workshop or session with people and then coming back to it. Uh, and then some of the techniques that I really like uh, like to use to help with uh, having that effective structure and making sure that, that it goes in, uh, that it's delivered well as part of a workshop is time boxing what we're doing. So going, this is going to take this long. Uh, I sometimes will overestimate with like five minutes. So then I have enough time for discussion uh, because like, uh, it's not a really good workshop if no one gets to talk. 
<laughs> and they just have to write everything down. So you want to be able to have that conversation, uh, clarify any of your questions, have everyone come along that journey and understand what other people are thinking so that it might uh, direct or guide their thoughts as well. Uh, and then the other one uh, I always like to do, kind of like what I was talking about, but it's like agenda hacking. So as I'm going through the session, uh, if something's taken longer, I'm then adjusting and like writing down if I have a, a printed out version or a physical agenda, I'm adjusting my next activities to go, oh, I need to take five minutes off this. Oh, this one took longer. So therefore this one, this other activity might take a bit longer. And then another way of uh, kind of helping with this is whether you incorporate breakout sessions uh, to keep your participants engaged and focused as well. But also so that uh, if you're short on time, especially if it's a short project, to uh, allow you to get more done during the session. So you might send people off on different adventures and activities that they're doing, and then they come back and share their thoughts with everyone. And then other people are then invited to share their thoughts on that. They haven't taken part in that activity, but they're you're able to also then gather other people's thinking and ways, uh, ways of solving that problem or thinking about that area as well or providing their insight as well. Uh, and then you can have each person do that. So you're able to get a bit more done during a short time period. Uh, and then the other thing that's really important is uh, if time starts to get away during the session is to be okay with making those adjustments or calling that out during the session that we actually only have this much more time. So we either need to move a bit faster or we need to acknowledge that we're going to spend the rest of the session doing this. And then we might need to have another, another workshop together. Uh, and then being clear, therefore, we're not going to meet all of these objectives. Uh, what's more important for us uh, as a team and what do we want to get towards? And so I'll usually do that more during like internal sessions rather than customer ones, uh, just because like uh, they're able to help guide that uh, rather than customers being able to guide that. Uh, if it's a customer session, then I, I will just make the call myself. I'll go... Uh, and I guess how I do that is how I structure the objectives or activities that I go. Um, I'll make sure that I get my most important ones done first. And then if I miss out on the bottom ones, then I'm okay with that. Or I have or I have a way or I come up with a way to, to be able to adjust that. Uh, so I've talked a bit about this one, but I think it's really important uh, to kind of discuss again, which is the facil facilitating diverse perspectives. So making sure that you address those power dynamics uh, and using some different tools to be able to do it. Uh, so I always love to do that by creating a welcoming and respectful environment. So like I've talked about those rules of play, like how are we going to engage with each other? What are we going to do? Uh, and also making everyone feel valued and heard. So it's the role of the facilitator to like make that eye contact, to acknowledge what people are saying, to thank them for their thoughts and to encourage that environment. So I always like to think that you bring the energy and you craft the energy for the session to make sure that everyone wants to engage and be part of it. Uh, and so an example of this uh, is say during a session, uh, I've had people that, uh, someone's speaking up and they're like overpowering others. And so I always let them know, uh, I'll, I'll always try and pick up on that like straight away uh, and let them know uh, the way that I want them to engage. Uh, I'll be like, you've actually interrupted this person. I would like, uh, I want to actually finish hearing their thoughts. Uh, happy for you to note that down and then we can address that later. And so once you've done that, I always find once I've done that the first time, then people start to know that this is how we're going to engage during this session. And so making sure that you're setting those expectations and you're reinforcing the behavior that you're looking for during sessions. And so I had someone that did that uh, during one of my first workshops. Uh, and then I've had multiple workshops with them following that and they haven't done that again. So since I've set those expectations of this is how we engage and this is the rules of play of how we run workshops and how we position and how we were a participant in the session, then people usually know for the future sessions, this is how I engage. Or if I have a thought, I'll note it down. Uh, or if it's a topic that gets really big, then I'll often go like, let's put this in the parking lot as well. Uh, so some of the ways that I, I like to do this to help with that, uh, facilitating those diverse perspectives is brain writing. So getting people to just write down their thoughts, uh, doing it themselves. Uh, and then also like anonymous idea generation. So we're, we're just sticking ideas up on the wall. Uh, everyone's writing them down uh, and we're not like putting any names to them and we're just exploring it. 
or also the other way that I like to do this is those role plays that I talked about where we're we're basically role playing a, a, a conversation or an experience and then getting people to note down using like rose thorn buds. So what are the positives, negatives, or like opportunities of this experience? And basically doing that analysis by ourselves, uh, each person's writing down their thoughts, and then we're then sharing that and collaborating on it. And then the other parts that's really important for facilitation is to uh, foster reflection. And so reflecting uh, on what uh, what worked well, what didn't work well. And so what I always like to do is as part of a, a uh, workshop or something that I'm facilitating, I always like to run my own retro for myself to go, what did I do well? Where can I improve? What can I do differently for next time? And so basically understanding what am I going to change for my next area, uh, my next workshop? What do I want to do differently? How can I make this a better session? And then the other part is as well is to go, uh, what areas do I want to work on as well? Like, did I run out of time? Was there certain conversations that, that de derailed it uh, that I, I didn't pick up on? Or was there certain behaviours that were happening in the workshop that I, I want to make sure that I'm more aware of next time? And so reflecting on like how you were as a facilitator, how did like the activities go? How was the engagement and really understanding that? And I always like to do it like a start, stop, continue uh, to understand what are, what can I improve basically and what you can do sometimes as well if it's like early on running the workshops is that you could also have like a facilitation uh like a debrief with uh after you run a few get people's thoughts who have attended it like what did they like what didn't they like what are the, some of the areas that they think that you could improve on as well and start to understand that so uh, i just wanted to recap in terms of uh what have we covered uh in the session so there's quite a lot uh, so the role of the, the design of designers, so making sure that you understand your role as a facilitator, making sure that you're actively listening, creating the environment that allows people to do their best work or to be the, their best selves, to share their best ideas. Uh, the key principles of facilitation is really defining clear objectives, creating engaging activities, and then managing those group dynamics as well. And then techniques for success. Uh, when facilitating is really designing an effective structure. So making sure that you're going to get those objectives achieved uh, and making sure that you're uh, you're able to, to basically be uh, able to adjust and you're happy to, to make changes to get to those objectives or make changes based on the timing of activities. Uh, and then facilitate diverse perspectives. So making sure that you're able to gather, gather other people's thoughts what are they thinking, uh, making, because that's a pur purpose of facilitation and running a workshop is gathering all of those different thoughts and ways of thinking. And then fostering reflection, uh, foster reflection. Uh, so making sure that you're reflecting on how did the session go? Where can I improve? How can I get better? Or what are the things that I'm doing really well as well? Uh, so that you can really start to hone and craft and adjust how you work as a facilitator and how you make your sessions really good. Uh, so uh, what I wanted to do was go back to that initial story uh, that I was talking about where we weren't getting those outcomes uh, and we weren't going to get the the right outcomes of how, like what is the structure of a financial advice plan that the customers were looking for. Uh, so when we came back from that break, so we had about a 15 minute break. Uh, we basically, during that time, we came up with a new activity for them. Uh, and then within 15 minutes, so we time capped ourselves, we we're able to basically fulfill our research objectives uh, and answer the questions our stakeholders had by basically taking that pause. And overall, uh, that day of research was a massive, massive success. We we're able to achieve all of our research objectives, gain the insights that we needed to be able to deliver a better experience and to also create a new way of delivering a financial advice plan. And so by having that that moment of pause uh, and not panicking and not continuing to try and make it work, we're able to get to the outcomes. And so what I learned from this is the, uh, like the points that I shared today, it's important to continually be reflecting during your facilitation. Are we hitting those objectives? Are we getting out what we need from the session? Uh, how is this actively getting us towards the outcomes? Are we getting there? Uh, and so to be able to do that, you need to be actively listening and being able to improvise on the spot and make those changes on the fly. And so you need to be 
flexible to changing and adjusting as you go through and so making sure that you're happy uh, and comfortable with change and and some of those like spontaneous adjustments that you need to make. And so the quality of the insights and the outcomes that you get from sessions is only as strong as the facilitator's skills and how they're engaging during the session and how they're running a session. And so as a designer, it's essential you're a really good facilitator to be able to lead the team and guide them towards those outcomes as it's the really it's basically the cornerstone to really starting to deliver exceptional exceptional and really impactful outcomes as as you work through different workshops and as you work through like more complex problems uh so uh thank you so much uh for coming along uh if you want to you can also scan the qr code i have um you can connect with me on linkedin uh but i also have like a little power up that's help that i put together that kind of helps you to basically get your designs delivered uh which is super fun. Uh, I think there's like about five or so there. Um, so the last one that we have is uh, basically questions from the room. Yeah, so we've had a few pop up in the chat. Um, the first one is from Naz. Um, how could we navigate different stakeholder archetypes in an ideation slash co-design workshops, like different familiarity with the design process and level of value or influence they might have on the project. Yeah. I always find, um, I always like to reflect on who are the participants. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, I always like to reflect on who are the people that I'm inviting to the session. And so therefore who, like, should I have a different person? Uh, like, should I have two sessions where if there's people who are more familiar, should they be part of one session or there's certain expertise? Like, do I want to deep dive with them? So how I'll often sometimes run my workshops is um, I'll have a one that's specifically with our risk team uh, where I'm deep diving on there. What are they doing? How does this work? Coming up ideas with them. Uh, I have one with our, our sales ops team uh, where I'm really deep diving and, and getting those ideas. And it also kind of depends on the, the time frame that you have as well for the project. Uh, but then if it's have have if I have people who have different levels of influence, uh, I always like to either have that conversation beforehand if I know that they're, like, they're potentially going to be a dominating stakeholder during the session to talk a bit about like this is what we're looking for during the session uh, and talking through with them to let them know that like I really want to get their ideas but I want to make sure that everyone's heard. And then also like with familiarity to the design process, I always like to set that context at the start of the session to go this is what we're doing and why. And sometimes you don't even need to refer that this is part of the design process it's just like this is the outcome that we want to get towards so we want to improve this part of the experience so what we're going to do today is come up with some ideas together and really framing and going through that to go this is how we're going to do it uh, and this is a methodology that we can use or like a way for us to do it and come up with those ideas together because we're all the subject matter experts in this uh uh on this topic so thank you so much um Sue has, um, how to navigate scenarios where people that feel shy and are introvert, um, who might not feel comfortable, uh, sharing their thoughts in a workshop with a lot of stakeholders. So how do you kind of cater towards, um, those personalities? Yeah. Uh, so the way I really love to do this is to, uh, like, like I was talking about where you get people to write down their thoughts. So if someone, uh, doesn't feel comfortable sharing their thoughts, uh, I'll, I'll always make sure that I gather them. So either I'll spend some time with them while everyone else is doing the activity, chatting to them in terms of like, what do they think? Uh, if I've noticed that they're not sharing as much, uh, I might uh, pick out different people to share their thoughts and ideas and just see if they're comfortable sharing them. But I'll always give them that time beforehand to write down on a post-it note, like uh, we're exploring, exploring this topic or I want you to answer this question. Uh, I'd love to get you to write that down. So then I always have their thoughts at least documented as well. And then if I do need to, sometimes what I'll do is uh, if they're not happy sharing during the session and I need to gather a bit more information as to like, what did that post-it note mean? Uh, then I'll book another session with them to, to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation if they didn't feel comfortable uh, comfortable speaking up. And so as a facilitator, I always find it's really important to observe what's happening. How are people engaging? Are there certain people that aren't engaging much? And do I want to call out and ask them to share their thoughts? Uh, and then if they don't want to during the session, 
then I might ask them at the end or message them afterwards and be like, oh, I'd really love to get your thoughts uh, and and to hear more from you. And so usually when, when I do that, that then starts to make them feel more comfortable that they can share in front of others because they do see that their ideas are valued. Um, Just uh, riffing on that, I bet that sometimes that's when that kind of flexibility comes into play and kind of um, maybe changing your activity based on kind of the majority of the people that are in the room. If you've got a lot of introverts, maybe you need an activity that's more um, singular as opposed to working with others. Yeah. Yeah. And so say when you're doing that planning before the session as well, yeah, it's super important to go like, what are the types of people that I'm going to be engaging with and how do I structure the session in a way so that we're able to get the most out of everyone? Because the purpose of the session is so that everyone can contribute and everyone can have a part and their thoughts are heard. And so how do I, yeah, like you said, or how do I adjust it if, if this session, if this isn't working for this person, how do I encourage them to, to still share their ideas? Awesome. I'll jump down to the next question. And also if um anyone wants to raise their hand and ask the question themselves, they're more than welcome to. Otherwise I will continue to read. Um, Emily asks, could you share your tips and learnings on managing group dynamics that go awry, get out of hand? Uh, for example, people being disrespectful to others, ignoring ground rules of the session, et cetera. Yeah, uh, so this is my favorite thing to do. <laughs> uh, so I will either it'll be in front of others that I will call it out uh, and let them know that I like if they've interrupted someone else I'll let them know that I want to hear this person uh, and what they've been talking about and and just basically reset the room to be like this is how we want to engage during the session uh, and that that's also if it keeps happening like this is how we engage during the session I want to hear everyone's thoughts uh, if you're going to talk over other people we're not able to do that and I often like to take pauses after I say those things and not make it like directed at someone if if that's how I'm needing to reset the room as well, but let them know that like what we're wanting to do is hear everyone's ideas, collaborate effectively. So I need you to not speak over each other. Uh, I want to make sure that we we get to the objectives that we're looking for. So often I'll bring it back to it's not just on me. It's like the purpose of this session is that we get to these outcomes. And so therefore if we're not going to be able to hear other people's thoughts, then we're not going to be able to achieve the session. And I will have to have another session uh, for us to be able to do that. And if they continue to ignore the ground rules, I will continue to call call them out for this uh, during the session. Uh, or I will ask them that like, actually, like this isn't working. Uh, I either need, I need you to just basically write down your thoughts uh, so that I can really start to engage with everyone. And then I'll have a conversation with them afterwards uh, about how, and basically give feedback in terms of like constructive feedback to go uh, during the session uh, you were interrupting or over, over talk, uh, talking over the top of everyone, uh, which resulted in us not being able to get to the outcomes that we were looking for. Uh, in my next session, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if you'd wait till uh, someone had finished speaking to share your thoughts or document them down so I can get to them. Or I'm happy to have a separate session with you where we can really start to deep dive this, if this is an area that you you really want to share your thoughts and opinions. And so also giving them that opportunity to share it in a different way as well. So if they're going to speak over other people, it might be because they feel like they haven't been heard before. And so then giving them another avenue to, to be able to share their thoughts. Thank you. I'm going to jump down. So hopefully we get um, one question answered um, from everyone. Um, Sarah Roberts, I actually had the same question that I jotted down in my notes. So keen to hear the answer. Um, have you found that certain activities work best for neurodiverse people if you aim to create an inclusive environment? I was thinking in terms of um, maybe dyslexia or autism and um, yeah, how you kind of cater for like overstimulation perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. So I always like to, um, so if there is like anything that is like a bit too chaotic, um, and I think that's why like breakout rooms work really well especially if you're in, in person as well, is like having people go to different areas to discuss different things. So it's not like there's so much noise happening. There's so many things happening as well. Uh, and then also those ground rules as well, that it's like, so that we're not interrupting each other, that we're making sure that we're hearing each other. Uh, so there's not too much background noise or, or anything like that. And then the other part as well that I find works really well is like allowing people to, to share in, their, in a way that works for them as well. 
Uh, so it's not like we all have to note down our ideas. If you have a different way that you want to do it, or if you want to do the activity in a different way, like let's discuss and chat as well. Uh, and then also from what I always like to do as well is, uh, so say when I have, before I have, like if it's an internal one uh, that I'm having, like being able to observe people as well, like how do they share their ideas? How do they talk? So how do I structure and make sure that the workshop's going to work for them? Uh, and then if it's like a, a customer one as well, is making sure that I give those op options for us to engage in different ways. Uh, if it's going to be a group session with customers as well. So it's not like you have to write it down. Uh, some people might not like that. They might they might prefer typing or what are some of those optionalities of ways? And then also being really aware and asking people as well, like how do you want to, is, is this working for you? And so that that point where I said around observing body language and, and stuff like that, is someone like shutting down that they, they're they not engaging anymore? Uh, do I have a, can I like have a conversation or like pause the session and give us a break now so I can have a conversation with that person and be like, uh, I want to make sure that this is an environment that works for you. And so talking to them to be like, oh, what's a better way for us to engage? What works for you? And so I've, I've done that before in sessions when I've noticed that like, say, a key stakeholder is not engaging, uh, where I've just taken a, a pause for us to make sure that that they are, uh, that the environment is going to work for them as well. Um, have you found that there are ways to kind of front foot some of those uh, concerns? Like, would you potentially ask stakeholders um, before the session even started or as you're kind of in that kind of planning and ideation phase, um, consider some of those. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So I think, yeah, especially the, um, I spend like quite a lot of my time. Uh, so I think like sometimes like the session might only go for an hour, but like I'll spend most of my time, like the pre-prep, like if you plan the session really well, then it, it allows you to like flow into the session really easily and like run it really well but yeah having those conversations with stakeholders as well to find out like what's uh what's the best way to engage with them what works well for them and like understanding from them so that you can then add that to how you run the session with them um I'm gonna jump back up quickly do you have any suggestions for icebreaker activities to get people warmed up uh, so icebreakers, I always find um, either like a drawing one's really fun or like a, a funny question uh, mm -hmm. is really fun as well. Or I often like to use like some improv techniques as well, where it's like, let's either do, um, uh, oh, what is it called? Like, is it similes or like words that are similar? So like, I'll say Apple and then you'll say like whatever comes to mind and doing activities like that uh, where there's like no right or, or wrong answer, or it's like writing down a word or even just sharing a story from your day around a certain topic, like, or even answering a question like, oh, what's your favorite type of ice cream or something like that. So then we're also getting to know each other as well. Awesome. Um, and then do you have any resources that you found helpful in kind of your journey to become a fantastic facilitator? Gosh, I think my, what I found really useful in terms of uh, resources uh, my, and I think it's like the, the key one that I shared at the end around that reflection is to go like, what's working, what's not. Uh, so one of the areas that I really grew in was like making sure that I allocate time. And so once you run more workshops, it's like, then going like, oh, okay, that activity ran for about this long. Uh, but then other resources that I always like to get better as a facilitator, uh, I always like to draw from other areas of life. Uh, so I don't, I don't often run like each workshop's always different. So I, I always like to go, what are my objectives? And then what is a fun way for us to do this or for us to engage with each other? And so they're not really resources, but it's like a way of thinking is going like, oh, we want to um, come up with like a new dashboard. So we could do a card sort or we could do like an analysis of like a bunch of different ones and like cut that up and like come up, come together with it. Uh, and basically just ways to think differently as well so that you're working on those different skill sets as well and then also I've uh, how I've also gotten better at facilitation is by reflecting on those skills that you need uh, to run a really good se uh, session is like being comfortable with ambiguity uh, embracing like failure as well like as my uh, self as a facilitator as well and so developing a lot of those skills I found really helpful as well is that there's no right or wrong during the session is that, uh, and I'm not going to look silly if I say that like, oh, we need to change the activity as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. 
Um, we'll end on this final question. Um, how do you deal with self-designated devil's advocates? I'm sure it's similar to kind of the disruptive personalities. So, so is that someone that, uh, were they playing, so they're playing de devil's advocate where it's like, this might not be. The... That's kind of, yeah. So, um, I, I'm assuming, and, and Elia, please feel free to to jump in, that um, maybe it's kind of those disruptive personalities where someone's always kind of like, oh, to play devil's advocate, like, have you thought yeah. of this? And then it's just kind of maybe um, interrupting uh, yeah. the session a bit more. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was, oh, sorry. Please. I was more getting at the people that they're not disrupting, they're not, like, talking over people, they're not stepping out of the rules of play but everything they say is shooting down somebody else's idea or saying like, oh, here's the reason that won't work. Uh, okay, no, that makes more sense. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so uh, what I like to do there is basically go, uh, I always like to have a session um, that is more around, I'm just going to share that link uh, for everyone, uh, is that my the session is really around like I like to build like and and I, a lot of the stuff I I build from for my sessions is like from improv so it's like I want to be yes and uh, mm -hmm. so it's like how do you be yes and instead of no but or like yes but and so then it's like well what if we flipped that and so how do we make that like flip that into a positive and and go this is like either coming back to the the purpose of the session is that we want to come up with ideas it's less about solutions right now how do we come up with new ideas for us to generate like a better experience? How do we, uh, how do we make this more of a exploration of this and making it more towards that rather than the negativity? And so I always like to yeah basically call that out and go like, well, actually we're coming up with ideas during this session, uh, and it's less about facilitate uh, uh, functionality or uh, technical feasibility, and so letting them know basically that like that's actually not the purpose of this session is to come up with that. And so I want you to think in this way and letting them know that I need them to actually adjust their thinking and the way that they're coming up with ideas uh, rather than it focusing on like the negatives. We are technically over time. Um, so I'll leave it up to you if you'd like to answer the final question um, or uh, we can end it here. Uh, which one's the final one? The results driven? Yeah. Uh, I, I like touched that. on it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so for results driven ones, uh, so I will basically have the conversation with the the stakeholders to go. This is what we're currently missing. Uh, so either I'll synthesize what we got from the workshop and I'll go, this is what, what we learned from it, but there's like gaps in terms of this. And then this is the reasons why, like you said, like lack of, en lack of engagement, uh, when the session, like we weren't able to achieve these objectives and letting them know that we'll need to run another session to better get to those outcomes. And then checking that, like, based on the timeframes that we have, does that, like, can we adjust the timeframes? Can we do something different? Am I able to get these people sooner, especially if they're like, ex uh, uh, what is it called like a busy participants that I'm trying to book in and like they're not available to next week is there a way that you can like work with their managers to make sure that I can get with them soon catch up with them sooner uh, and then I'll also set reset the expectations during that workshop again is that like oh we need to catch up again uh, because we weren't able to hit all of our objectives during the session and so making sure that it's really clear in terms of communicating that to everyone and making sure that everyone's on the same page like especially those results driven like leaders and stakeholders uh, and if time frames are really short going that we need to do this to better get to those outcomes uh, and that they're on the same page as to why. And then also I'll have like say conversations with people. Uh, it, I'll either send an email, send a message to let them know that we're having this other session uh, because of these reasons. So I'd really like to make sure that we hit the objectives in this next one. Awesome. Thank you so much um, for sharing and answering all the questions and also uh, clearly running through uh, the facilitation. I definitely learned a lot, um, uh, which is uh, so great. Um, yeah, thank you yeah. so much. I appreciate oh. it, it's a fun. <laughs> Good. Um, again, please, uh, I'll stop the recording.